guys welcome to IMT doctor today in this video we will be discussing the syncope cluster where we'll be looking at the definition the causes of syncope and then how to approach a case of syncope for the AMC clinical examination and finally we will look at the AMC cases everything that we are going to discuss will be timestamped down below in the description box so let's start with the definition of uh, syncope syncope is defined as transient loss of consciousness it is associated with postural collapse and it's caused by cerebral hyperperfusion. Uh, syncope, it can be just a benign faint or it may be due to a potentially life-threatening condition. And in most cases, a detailed history and physical examination will help you come to a diagnosis. The syncope often has a prodrome. It's called presyncope. And here the patient complains of lightheadedness, blood vision, sweating, tinnitus, nausea, and weakness. And presence of these prodromal symptoms often favors a syncopal event. And hence, it's very important that you ask these symptoms in the history. Now, let's look at the causes of syncope. We have neurally mediated reflex syncopal syndromes, that is vasovagal syncope, situational syncope, and then we have orthostatic and cardiac syncope. Now let's look at um, these causes in more detail. So in neurally mediated reflex syncopal syndromes, as the name suggests, it is mediated by the inappropriate triggering of a reflex autonomic response. Like um, in case of the space of vagal syncope, what's happening is that your body reacts to certain triggers such as sight of blood or prolonged standing, hot environment, or any extreme emotional distress. So these stimuli triggers the autonomic reflexes that causes your heart rate to decrease and your blood pressure also drops. This will ultimately cause a decrease in the blood flow to your brain and resulting in loss of consciousness. So these vasovagal syncope, these are the most common cause of syncope. Uh, although it can occur at any age, it is more common in um, teens or 20s. Now, uh, moving on to the situational syncope. Uh, here we have a known precipitant that will trigger the autonomic reflexes, which will result in cerebral uh, hyperperfusion, resulting in loss of consciousness. Now, some of these triggers are uh, maturation, cough, sneeze, swallow, defecation, and post-exercise. So in history taking, uh, you have to ask about these precipitating factors if you're thinking of situational syncope. Also ask about the warning signs, uh, that is the pre-syncopal symptoms. And also ask uh, if the patient sustained any injury because in these cases, uh, it's very uncommon uh, to sustain injury. Now coming to orthostatic syncope, it is due to hypotension on assuming an upright position. And this is what it differentiates it from neurally mediated reflex syncope. Um, that is the loss of consciousness here. It occurs soon after a change in the posture and there is no bradycardia. Hence, when you're taking a history, you need to ask uh, to the patient, you know, like, do you feel uh, dizzy or do you lose consciousness when you stand up quickly? And also in physical examination, you need to um, uh, look for the orthostatic hypotension. Now, this is caused uh, by an autonomic failure, which can again be primary or a secondary autonomic failure. So in primary, we have pure uh, autonomic failure, multiple system atrophy, Parkinson's disease with autonomic failure. And in secondary, we need to uh, think of diabetic neuropathy, drugs, and alcohol. Hence, in history, uh, always ask about uh, the past history of diabetes and drugs uh, such as antihypertensive medications. Then the second cause is due to volume depletion, where uh, it can be due to hemorrhage, diarrhea, or Edison's disease. So in history, look out for any um, signs of bleeding, any uh, history of diarrhea, and uh, in physical examination, always look for signs of dehydration. So now we have cardiac syncope. It is due to a sudden reduction in cardiac output. It may either be due to uh, arrhythmias or structural heart disease. In arrhythmias, we have bradyarrhythmias, such as sinus node dysfunction, atrioventricular conduction system disease, and in tachyarrhythmias, we have paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. So in structural heart disease, we have causes such as cardiac valvular disease like aortic stenosis, uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, atrial myxoma, acute aortic dissection, pericardial disease or tamponade, 
pulmonary embolus or pulmonary hypertension. Uh, now that we know there are so many cardiac causes of syncope, it's very important that in history we ask about the cardiac symptoms such as palpitations, chest pain, breathlessness. And uh, syncope that occurs during exertion is a critical clue for cardiac origin. Uh, and usually syncope here there is no relation to the posture and uh, you have to ask about history of cardiac diseases and uh, a family history of sudden death is also very important to ask uh, because it can give you a clue to long QT syndrome which is again a very important case in AMC. So then um, talking about the differential diagnosis of syncope we need to consider other causes of loss of consciousness so um, in DD, you should uh, ask about hypoglycemia, seizures, uh, TIA, um, especially of vertebrobasilar origin and uh, intoxications. Now coming to history taking. So initially you want to determine if the person had a complete loss of consciousness or not. Then you want to ask questions uh, to know what happened before, during and after the event. So in before you want to ask what was he doing? Okay, because here you want to know if there was any triggers such as prolonged standing, micturition or any change in posture that precipitated the loss of consciousness. Then uh, you can ask about the warning signs. So here you can ask about the presyncopal symptoms such as lightheadedness, blood vision, sweating, tinnitus, nausea and weakness. Now these symptoms favor uh, an episode of syncope. Similarly, you can ask about strange smell or feeling of deja vu, which suggests an aura and therefore a seizure. Then ask, you can also ask about if the patient had any uh, palpitations, which point towards the cardiac syncope. Then in during, you can ask for how long did the episode last and uh, if it has happened before or not. If yes, then you want to ask more in detail about the previous episodes as well. Then ask if there was any witnesses who noticed any jerky movements or change in color of face or lips. Also ask if the patient uh, passed urine or stool during the episode or if there was any tongue bite. Then in after, uh, you can ask whether the patient woke up normal or if there was any drowsiness. Then also ask if the patient sustained any injuries. Then coming to past medical history. Uh, here you want to ask if there was any, um, you know, previous history of heart diseases, diabetes, or any history of epilepsy. Then comes family history. Again, you have to ask about any sudden death in the family or history of fainting uh, in family. Then ask about the SADMA questions. Here, drug history is very important. So uh, particularly look for uh, antihypertensives and diuretics. So in physical examination, in general appearance, ask about the hydration status, look for pallor, and also look for injuries that is sustained during the event. In vitals, uh, don't forget to ask about uh, the lying and standing blood pressure, and this is to look for any postural drop. Then uh, don't forget to examine the cardiovascular system and the neurological examination. Uh, you can uh, look for cardiac murmurs and any other neurological deficits. And in bedside test, uh, ask about the blood glucose levels and if any ECG is available. So then we move on to the cases uh, for AMC. So this is our first case. There's a 17 year old girl who has fainted in school and is brought by father to the emergency department. She has multiple faints in the last three months. ECGs has, uh, ECG has been done, uh, which will be provided after completing other tasks. And your task is to take further history and ask about physical findings and investigations that you want from the examiner and explain the patient about the possible diagnosis and differentials. So for history taking, you need to follow the same structure that we have discussed. And uh, based on this recall, we have got um, these positive findings. So there is loss of consciousness for around 30 seconds. And this happened when the patient was singing at school and she recovered completely. And this is her third time. She has had similar episodes previously. There's no prodromal symptoms, no cardiac symptoms, and almost all other findings are uh, negative. And even on physical examination, everything is normal. 
but when you ask uh, for ECG, you will find a long QT interval. So, uh, and blood sugar level is also normal. So here, this is a case of long QT um, syndrome. Now, this is just a recall, so you have limited findings, but in exam, you can expect other findings to be positive as well. But what I think is that in syncope cluster, uh, the key point is that you need to ask all the questions so that you can rule out all possible causes of syncope. So how do you explain a uh, long QT syndrome to the patient in a simple language? So what you can see is that based on the history, physical examination and investigations, what you're having is a condition called long QT syndrome. And also check patients understanding here. So ask them like, you know, have you heard about it? Do you have any idea? And then you can start explaining. So you can draw a picture of the heart and then start explaining that the heart has four chambers, the two upper and two lower chambers. Its function is to pump blood to the body and this is controlled by the electrical system of the heart. And the electrical impulse, it starts from the SA node and then it travels uh, throughout the upper chambers and then from the AV node, uh, it travels to the lower chambers and finally the heart contracts. So again, you need to explain this uh, by showing a picture uh, because it becomes easier. And then tell that in long QT syndrome, uh, there's a problem in the electrical conduction of the heart. And cause usually it's a genetic mutation or it could be secondarily due to medications. Now because the ECG is also given to you, so you need to explain it to the patient. Uh, so you can uh, draw the picture or you can show it in the ECG itself. So tell them that the electrical system of the heart is recorded in the ECG and the waves shows the electrical activity of the heart. The P wave, it represents the activity in the upper chambers. The QRS and the T represent uh, activity in the lower chambers. And in your case, the ECG shows that an interval between the Q and the T wave is increased, which means that the heart takes longer time to contract the lower chambers. So the heart is uh, actually less efficient to pump the blood to the rest of the body. And at the same time, the brain is also receiving less blood. And that's why you're having these fainting episodes. And um, after that, uh, you can go on to the differential diagnosis. So here, um, the DDs, you can mention all the types of syncope, okay? And also mention the other causes of transient loss of consciousness. And then uh, try to explain how you rule them out. Then in uh, for long QT syndrome, the clinical diagnosis is usually made uh, from a combination of suspicious history, family history, and ECG. And for ECG, uh, the corrected QT interval is usually more than 0.47 in women and uh, more than 0.46 seconds in men. Now, uh, coming to treatment, uh, we can give medications that is beta blockers or implantable cardioverter defibrillators. But if management is a task in the exam, um, you're, you're not the one who's gonna give these medications. So you need to always mention to the patient that you know the heart specialist will review you, will assess you, and may start you on medications called beta blockers. And um, then lifestyle modification is also very important. You know, some degree of limitation in sporting activities is always required. And also ask the patient to avoid uh, medications that prolong QT interval. So what you can say is that, you know, if you're planning to take any medications, always consult with your GPs first. And then once the diagnosis is confirmed, uh, genetic testing uh, in the family members may also be required. So that's it for this video. I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for watching.